the word tenor implies tenor, you know, as in tenor voice, or you know, which is a certain clef, a certain range, and it's it's a male voice basically. And uh, there's something about that that you know resonates with me. I mean, I, it's it's uh, it's comparable to my speaking slash singing voice, and uh, I think people uh, people can connect with that, and you know. Uh, uh, it provided that the music is expressive and compelling and, you know, projecting in, in some sort of interesting way. And uh, I've just, I've always been attracted to the great tenor saxophone players. John Coltrane, George Coleman, Sonny Rollins, Dexter Gordon, Sonny Stitt, Coleman Hawkins, Ben Webster, uh, Lester Young, Gene Ammons, Wayne Shorter, Michael Brecker, on from there. <laughs> Jerome Kern tune, All the Things You Are, and uh, it's, it's a fantastically constructed tune, beautiful tune, and uh, I, I love playing that tune because it's, it's just so beautifully conceived where there's, there's this melody, boo, bee, boo, doo, 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 dee, doo, doo, bee, boo, da, that repeats the second phrase in another place, do dee, boo, doo, doo, dee, doo, doo, bee, doo, ba, da, right? So then the, the, the bridge is, Boo boo bee bee boo 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 bee bee, and then that phrase repeats in another place. Boo boo bee bee boo 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 bee bee. Then we go back to the top. Boo bee boo doo 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 dee boo doo. Then there's sort of a tag or a little ending. Bee boo 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 doo boo dee boo doo boo doo doo dee boo da. It's just it's genius, you know. It's simplicity and genius, you know, uh, the most eloquent, beautiful tune in the world. The choice of notes in the melody are exquisite. And uh, in fact, all those notes are the third of each chord. We're getting a little technical now, but, but actually that it's, it's just an incredible tune, you know, that, that if you play the melody, uh, you hear the harmony as well, which is really one of the, uh, one of the signposts of a you know, brilliantly conceived tune. You just heard me play on the Eastman 52nd Street tenor saxophone. It's a beautiful instrument. Uh, I've always been a Selmer guy, you know, playing old vintage Selmer horns. And this is the first horn I've actually been able to pick up and feel immediately comfortable on. It's just got a certain sound and feel and ring to it that I really appreciate a lot. So the, 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 the people that have worked on this instrument really have done a great job and they've come up with something that is probably the next best thing to an old vintage saxophone like what, what I would typically play. 
And I think, it, you know, this is a key ingredient, really, in uh, being able to, to play and express yourself. You don't want to even know that you're playing an instrument. You want that to just be working and, and, and in a place where it kind of plays itself so that you can actually get to the music, you know. And, and uh, by having a horn that feels comfortable and compelling, you are in essence stepping out of the way and allowing the music to come out. You know, if it's an instrument that you're not quite comfortable with, you're distracted by this and it, it's, you know, it could impede the flow. So, so having an instrument that I feel comfortable on is really an integral part of just being expressive and, you know, letting the music come so out. Playing the saxophone in general coming up in New York City, in and around New York City, and uh, it was, this was in the early 70s and I feel very fortunate to have been on the scene at that time, there was a certain energy, vitality in the air. There were uh, lofts where musicians would gather and play. Uh, it was kind of a known entity that no one was going to make a living playing jazz. So we supplemented our incomes by playing weddings and bar mitzvahs and Broadway shows or amateur shows or whatever the case may have been at that time. And it was all about the music, and I did a lot of playing and learning, and there was a lot of sharing of ideas, and it was a fantastic time. And, uh, you know, 40 years later, here I am still with that same energy, that same enthusiasm for the music, you know, wanting to learn and continue, continuing to learn. And it's been an incredible journey, you know. I mean, it started purely wanting to play the music and then sort of being hit with the reality that I, I also wanted to pay my rent. So, um, and I also had interests in many facets of music. I mean, I played flute and clarinet and saxophone. I was a doubler, so that in, uh, afforded me the opportunity to play in Broadway shows, to do some studio work. Um, and all of this kind of informed and supported my true passion which was playing the saxophone, playing improvised music on the saxophone and writing and uh, arranging music. So I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to do these things over the years. Uh, I had the great fortune to work with great musicians, you know, over a 40-year history, starting with Humir Diodato, 1974, Buddy Rich, 75 to 77, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, 78 to 80, uh, Jaco Pastorius, 81, 82, uh, my own big band, which started around 83 in New York, playing with people around New York like Art Blakey, Joe Chambers, Ray Mantia, Hubert Laws. A big milestone uh, happened in 1990 when I joined a band called the Yellow Jackets, and, uh, and it's been with them for 22 years. I've had my own big band for 30 years. Um, I've written for symphony orchestra, for concert band, I've written saxophone quartets, I've written etude books for saxophone, so I've been very involved with many different corners of music and uh, it's been so very interesting and uh, uh, I, I, you know, it doesn't end, that's the beauty of this, it just keeps going, you know, there's always more things to learn, more things to do and uh, I'm so grateful to have trained in New York and spent the majority of my life in New York and now I live in Los Angeles. Three and a half years ago, 19, uh, 2008, I took a teaching job at the University of Southern California. It seemed like time to do this and uh, it's been wonderful living in Los Angeles. You know, a big change of scene but, 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 but a, a nice one, an interesting one, stirred the pot and uh, playing a little differently, hearing a little differently, writing a little differently, oh, playing no, with some other musicians and uh, you know I still go to the airport and get on a plane and travel around the world. I've always done that and will probably always do this but it's been nice changing the perspective in terms of where I live and living in a different place. Playing any instrument on a high level, uh, in, uh, in this case the saxophone, it, uh, really requires years and years of study, of listening, of absorbing, of playing, of pondering, uh, you know, of repertoire expansion, vocabulary development, all these things come into play and uh, it's taken me many, many years to get to the point where I am and I, I feel like I have a good long distance to go yet, you know, it's, it's ongoing. Um, the beauty really 
uh, is lies in the fact that as you become more familiar with with this vocabulary and the language, uh, things start to flow with greater ease, and you you just find that surprising things come out of the music because there's this spontaneity factor, and uh, you know if you have the vocabulary to support spontaneity with, uh, things happen. You know that that are. Uh, not of your own doing, it almost feels like. Uh, they come from someplace else, you know. But, uh, ha you know, having put in the time to really cultivate a vocabulary and repertoire allows these things to happen.